actually I get this question quite often and, and uh, unfortunately my sort of short answer to the question is that I have absolutely no idea. Uh, the longer answer to the question is that I think there are so many dynamics at play right now in, in education, uh, in uh, the work markets uh, globally that it's very hard to predict which kind of skills are actually going to be useful for people. And therefore I think that the, the most important thing that every educational institution should focus on is to how to engender the learning happens in those institutions, learning not just as some, some kind of like broad mechanical memorization, but also like, you know, in terms of like really retaining new understanding. And that what I envision as the future of educational institutions is that they would be able to provide every single person who goes through those institutions uh, with the understanding that they're capable of learning new things. Because I think that's going to be the crucial thing. We can't really predict which, you know, for example, which types of work will be uh, out there in 2030. It all depends on developments in things like artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, like software design, uh, user experience design. All, all these things have a huge impact on what kinds of things actually become reality and not just like, you know, hype or, or fantasy. And I think, like, rather than trying to predict which skill sets specifically will be useful in 20 or 30 years, I think we should more shift to this idea that we have a capacity of retraining ourselves, not just the, you know, the future generations, but also us, uh, that we have the capacity of, of, of ongoing, lifelong, life-wide learning, like learning that happens day in, day out. Uh, learning that happens not just in school but like through your, your entire professional career. Uh, learning that will be integ integrated in the workplace, that like you know that the workplace would provide you with opportunities to to retrain yourself, for example, like you know if, if um, a logistics company replaces all, all, all of their fleet of trucks with uh, automated trucks, then you would be able to retrain the, the, the drivers, uh, the truck drivers to new, new types of things. Mm -hmm. So I think the kind of like the long, long and the short of it is that the only thing that I can say with any confidence is that we should be, we should ensure that we learn to learn. Uh, and on top of that, I think we just need to be sensitive about how these changes play out and which things become reality and which don't and, and then work accordingly. Yeah, it's, it's possible. And if you think about games in general, it's already been done. Most ge great games are games that pretty much everybody plays. Uh, regardless of, of age. Um, an, an interesting realization that we made a couple of years ago, like, you know, back when, when we were researching uh, various aspects of game learning, was that uh, young kids don't actually play games that have been initially targeted for them if they get to choose. So actually kids, they want to play the games their older siblings, like, you know, like six-year-olds rather play games like Candy, uh, Candy for Saga or Clash of Clans than, you know, cute little, hey there, how are you doing games that have been initially targeted for six-year-olds. Uh, most mobile games, for example, have been explicitly targeted for, you know, just for, to begin with, for legal reasons, for kids older than 13-year-olds. And most six-year-olds and seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds play those mobile games that everybody else is, is playing, if they get to choose. And the only, only reason why there's, you know, even some semblance of business out there for those like younger kid games is that often parents or, and or teachers in schools guide the kids to play those. And if they don't have a choice, then they will play those games, of course, like and, and any kid will play any game rather than like, you know, sitting in, in the pulpit with the school book, unless they're really excited about the topic that the school book is about. So I think to begin with, um, the, um, I don't think the kids want to be adults. They want to be people. And the problem with like kids, I think it's, it's a really great example the way you like post it like post kids and elderly. We treat them as not quite as people. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. And every single human being from the time they're born till the time they die uh, has an innate uh, need to be respected as a fully blown human being. I think that's one of the reasons why kids games, they're patronizing. They assume that these little people don't understand that well. We patronize elderly in many cultures the same way. Let me help you a little bit with that. And I can believe, like, you know, even like I'm, I'm just 40, but I can believe that how annoying that might be when you're 80 and somebody comes to you like, you know, that, so let me let me just do this for you. And like, you know, think about if we talk to each other like that, that would be horrible. We would hate that. And how, how would an old person or a young person 
not hate that uh, any, any, any less. So I think like it all boils down to actually just like you have to start with instead of target demographics. I, I don't really personally, I don't believe in demographics at all. All great games out there are demographic agnostic. I mean, of course, when you start a game, you might have some ballpark of like, you know, graphical style gameplay mechanisms. Uh, there are some things like, you know, like sex and violence, for example, that of course, like plays very strict boundaries. Uh, I obviously like, you know, would avoid those as components in, in a learning game, because I think it needs to be accessible also for very young people. Apart from that, I think like, you know, I mean, Candy Crush Saga is a great example. Uh, if we look at the kind of like um, the, um, the graphical uh, and the artistic look and feel of the game, it looks very childish. It looks very like, you know, five-year-old. It has this cardboard cut out, like little girls with curly hair and, hair and all of that. And it feels like, you know, it's made for five-year-old girls. Uh, at the same time, actually, the, the most active demographics in so far as I know are actually 30 to 35-year-olds. So like, you know, it's, it, and the reason is that even though it might look and feel a little childish, it's not a patronizing game. It doesn't treat you, you know, it doesn't treat you as an idiot. And I think like, you know, if a game treats you with respect, if it gives you challenges that you are excited about grasping, it doesn't really matter what it looks like or feels like in terms of uh, art and sound. Um, well, I mean, the parent's job is to bring up the kids. So like, you know, that, that means that uh, it's it's an active, not a passive role. So like you know, you are there with the kid. You are there for the kid. Uh, you are there uh, making sure that the kid does, learns to behave, learns to do cool stuff, uh, doesn't do idiotic stuff. Uh, ideally, in a way that doesn't patronize the kid or treat them as inferior. Uh, I often thought that like you know that kids are in very many ways they are just like small, sm like pint-sized human beings. Uh, that don't know as many things as we know, and that's the only difference. So there's a size issue that will be fixed with, with time, uh, and then there's the understanding issue that will be fixed with learning. And actually, if you think about any humans, the, the same thing, I mean, we're different sizes and shapes, and we won't know different things, so it's not that big of a deal, deal at the end of the day. Uh, as it comes to the parent responsibility in games, I think parents do have quite a big responsibility uh, in uh, regulating gameplay uh, and game usage. Uh, game addiction is a very real thing. There's like, you know, substantial, for example, one out of 10 Hong Kong kids with you know, recent research that I read uh, are severely addicted to video games. And that's like, it's not a good condition. Any like a severe addiction is not a good condition to be in. Um, and I, I would um, liken games, especially mobile games to candy. It's something that like that's amazing. That's really good for you in moderation because it gives you this like little highs and this like amazing like you know little sprinkle of like fairy dust in your life. But if you just keep eating, eating candy day in day out, you're gonna like you know your health is gonna deteriorate. You're not gonna feel good about yourself. You're not gonna be a feeling good. Period. And if you think, if you take a look about for example the um, mm, the dynamics of like neurotransmitters, what happens in the brain when people play games, is quite similar to 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 you know, for example, in terms of of dopamine metabolism, it's quite similar to things like candy or, or like you know or, um, well, I I wouldn't want to say like drugs because well, maybe like candy or alcohol or things like that. I think the drug metaphor is too too hard, because at the end of the day, like you know, it's not nowhere like sort of like the impact is nowhere in the same ballpark but it's the, it's the same sort of circuits that are being activated in the brain and i think like having said that it's very important for the parents just like they need to regulate the intake of candy they need to regulate the the uh, amount of time kids play with mobile games the way they need to regulate or us we need to regulate the um the the time people and kids and uh, spend on tv and I think it all boils down back to also that, you know, like Peter Westerbach, my co-founder, or one of our co-founders at Lightning Air, often says that, that like, you know, in Finland, uh, kids are people too. And that's kind of like, you know, the sort of like you know, the credo or the kind of like the, the basic idea there that, that we need to understand that all of the above, all of the, those things that I said, applies to us as well. And there are like, you know, there are several adults as, out there as well who are super addicted to video games or candy or TV or like... Whatever, and I, I don't think the solution is not to legislate against them because we need to have fun stuff in our lives. I mean, period. It's just like you know, fact of life. Uh, but we need to be. I think the parents' responsibility is to help kids grow into adults that can self-regulate the fun stuff.